We were blessed by an exceptional cadre of candidates. These people are very talented. The number one thing that really rose to the top of our base this time, me in particular as well, is who can win in 2024? Because you need to win. If you really believe it's the most important election of our lifetime, and a lot of us believe that, including myself, then you need to win. Right. And once you win, you need someone who can serve two terms, not be a lame duck on day one. There's a lot of things on the domestic front and on the international front that you need a leader today. Someone who can win, someone who can serve two terms, put a team around them that can actually do this job to drain the swamp and secure the border. All right, folks, today is Wednesday, but more importantly, it's 47 days from the Iowa caucuses. That's right. We are 47 days away from the first votes to determine who the Republican nominee will be. You need 1,215 delegates to secure the nomination. 40 are at stake in Iowa. Bob Vanderplatz is the head of the seat in the CEO of the family leader in Iowa. He's just made a critical endorsement there. Nikki Haley yesterday getting the endorsement of the Koch Network, the Americans for Prosperity. They're on the ground there. What does it all do to the race? How does it change Iowa? Everybody's all in on Iowa. We are gonna find out. Bob Vanderplatz is gonna break it down for us and tell us what it all means. Let's get into it with Bob. Bob, uh, welcome to the show. Good to be with you, especially as we kick off the holiday season. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I think you guys in Iowa, like, have got to balance the enjoyment of the holiday season, getting ready for Christmas and all that comes with that, with the excitement surrounding getting ready for your caucuses. That's definitely a balance. Uh, <laughs> it's a great way to enjoy Thanksgiving and then prepare for <laughs> Christmas. And then you got the New Year's in there too, and you're trying to watch a bowl game and you're trying to balance the caucuses as well. But we're excited that we get to do this, Sean. Yeah. So let me just, I want to get into a lot of your involvement in the Iowa caucuses, sure. et cetera. But I want to just start with having you give everyone a lay of the land. Like what, what is the lay of the land in Iowa right now with respect to the Republican presidential field? What should people take away from who's doing what and how they're doing? I think my takeaway would be is that Trump still has a big lead because he's yep. the former president. Uh, he's President Trump. Uh, he'll come in. He'll do a rally. He'll leave. His rallies aren't near what they used to be, though, here, Sean. Uh, he holds them in smaller venues. He packs them out, but they're much smaller venues. Uh, Ron DeSantis has an exceptionally strong ground game. He has a lot of endorsements, including that of Kim Reynolds, our governor, a lot of legislators, some of the key endorsers that you'd want to have in Iowa, he has. So I think his ground game, which is going to benefit a caucus a lot, is really stellar. I think Nikki Haley has found a lane which... Um, I would describe as kind of the, the George Bush lane, maybe the Mitt Romney lane. And that lane's only got so many people here. And so I think where her support is, that's probably what her support is going to be. I'm not quite so sure how she's going to grow that because I think Trump's second choice is DeSantis and DeSantis' second choice is Trump when you're talking right. about their voters. And then Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, he's a very compelling candidate and a lot of Iowans love to go and listen to him. Uh, will he be able to galvanize that into a caucus night um, effort? I'm not sure if that's going to work yet or not for him. So right now, I think the chance is DeSantis could overtake Trump, uh, but it would have to be a game change moment like Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton. So just to give people a sense of, of the, that day. Right. So the caucuses are on the 15th. It's a Monday. Uh, what does it involve going to a caucus? How many hours are you committing and, and what's the process look like? Well, the first thing is dress warm <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and make sure that you get your four wheel drive going. But uh, what you're going to do is you're going to go to a neighborhood setting. Uh, that could be a community library. That could be somebody's home. Uh, it could even be a gymnasium if some of them want to have all the precincts together. But typically they're smaller venues. And neighbors actually get up, Sean, and they advocate for a candidate. Uh, so for me, I'd advocate for Ron DeSantis. Uh, say Matt Whitaker, who's from Iowa, would get up in my precinct. He'd advocate for Donald Trump. And then somebody would advocate for Nikki Haley or Vivek or somebody else. And there's kind of a conversation. It's a discussion. And it's going to take about an hour and a half to two hours. And then they're going to vote. Are there any, are, Bob, are there any rules? Can you, can you talk, you know, do they say, Hey, everyone gets 10 minutes or 20 or how yeah, does that work? No, there's definitely rules. And it's like two to three minutes. It's not 10 okay. or 20 minutes. It's like two or three minutes. They will open up for a conversation for discussion, but then they're going to take a vote. 
And then each campaign or each representative will, you know, help calculate the votes or at least monitor the calculation of the votes. They turn it into the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State uh, will take a look at it, calculate it, and determine the caucus winner. But you're you're really committing when you go to an Iowa caucus, you're gonna you're gonna spend 90 minutes to two hours. And is it a set time? So you go at six o'clock or seven o'clock and that's... I believe it's usually seven o'clock. You can go there and register. All right, folks. You know, it seems like every time you see a doctor these days, the answer that they have is is a pill, that they're on the big pharma bandwagon to just fix any ailment with another prescription, which is why I think millions and millions of people have turned to a Texas doctor who is looking for clean ways of getting us back to better health. Um, In fact, we've all heard probably about collagen and all of the medical and health benefits of collagen. Um, And we know that it's been scientifically proven to increase bone and muscle strength, soothe joint pain, minimize wrinkles and cellulite. So, I mean, people see that, but the thing is, like all products, not all collagen is created equal. And a recent study found that, check this out, 64% of collagen protein powders have tested positive for arsenic and lead. That's why everyone interested in using collagen should see these warnings and find a clean and safe, effective product, which is why this doctor in Texas created Native Path. Now, he has created a collagen that is actually clean. It actually does what it's supposed to do. And he's not just done one, but they've got two. They've got another one for the evening that helps you sleep, plus a variety of other health-related clean products. This one is magnesium. We've all heard the benefits of magnesium. The key is to be buying your products in a native way, in a way that is clean and healthy, that actually delivers the results that you think you were. And Native Path now has thousands of five-star reviews, over 4 million jars of these products sold. Look, Native Path has thousands of five-star reviews and over 4 million jars sold of a whole host of health-related products. Every order comes with their 365-day money-back guarantee. There's no risk to try it right now. You can go to getnativepath.com slash Spicer and you get 45% off while supplies last. Getnativepath.com slash Spicer. As a Republican that day, and so you could be independent, register as Republican, and then go and participate in the Republican caucus. And the next day, you could reverse your, your status back to an independent if you wanted to. But the thing that's so unique to me is that it's sort of very old school, that you, you, you don't have a secret ballot, right? I mean, you're, you're getting up and saying, I support Ron DeSantis exactly. or Donald Trump or Nikki Hitt. Like, that's a very unique concept. I mean, so if you're there in your neighborhood, you mentioned, you know, Matt Whitaker and others, you have to be willing to get up and say, hey, neighbors, hey, colleagues, hey, family, I'm with Donald Trump, I'm with Nikki Haley, I'm with Ron. I mean, that's a very, very unique thing. How, as a, as a someone who's done this before, how, how tough is that for some people who might want to cast a ballot that they don't feel comfortable sharing with others? Well, there's no doubt it, it can be a little bit awkward uh, because you <laughs> like your neighbors. You want to you want to like your neighbors, right? And all of a sudden, you find out you're on different sides of something. Uh, but I think it's what makes Iowa very, very unique. Um, yeah. It's not a primary; it's a discussion, and that's why, if you remember, uh, in 2016, Sean um, Ben Carson was on CNN, I think, that night and said, well, he's not going right to New Hampshire. He's going to his home in Florida to get a change of clothes. And also the narrative became at caucuses, well, Ben Carson's not even going on to New Hampshire. So therefore, should you vote for him? And it got to be a big deal, but that's what it is. It's not a closed voting situation. It's a very open discussion. And so really, you can discuss a lot about different candidates or what you believe about them, that's up to the neighbors to you know make their decision. Ballpark, how many votes does it take to win the caucuses on caucus night? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, and give you a, total numbers. I think in 2016, there's 185,000 Republicans that showed up to cast a caucus vote. Um, this year, uh, talking with Governor Reynolds, uh, she actually believes we're going to go north of 200,000. Really? And if you go north of 200,000, you know, the way I look at it is that Donald Trump, uh, he's going to be probably somewhere between that 35% and 40% mark, which means there's 60 to 65% left for somebody else to get. And you only have really Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, and Vivek that are actively participating right now. They're going to get a large number of votes. 
So let's say that uh, a Ron DeSantis could coalesce with all of his endorsements and he could get to 40, 42 percent. Well, that means Nikki still could get her 15 to 20 and Vivek still gets somewhere between five and 10. That could actually happen. And if that happens, I think the narrative changes and becomes a two person race uh, going all the way through the primary cycle. Yeah. So let's just say 200,000 people run. Uh, so what are you looking at? 60,000 ish to, to win, you think? Well, you know, if you take a look at uh, 40% of that, uh, that's going to be 80,000 people. Okay. Uh, when you start, you know, doing the math of those things. So that's a lot of people. So even and when, when you uh, say, when, you, when, when the governor predicts this growth from about yeah. 180 to 200, do you have any idea where you think that comes from? Is it new voters? Is it disaffected Democrats, independents, where, where's the additional 20 coming from? I think it's going to be new voters. Matter of fact, yeah. um, Ann Seltzer, who's a very respected yep. pollster, uh, when she was polling the 2016 race, and you'll recall this, Sean, but she had Trump winning Iowa by 5%. And Cruz ended up winning by 4%. When you take a look, that's a 9% a nine percent turnaround. Right. And so I asked Ann, I said, how could you be off by nine points? And she said, we never saw the influx of evangelicals into the caucus process the way they did in 2016. And so Cruz won. And the untold story was that Marco Rubio just about took second. He, right. he, he almost got Donald Trump. And so if that happens again, where the church really invades the caucus or another uh, lane really invades the caucus. Uh, and that's where I think Governor Reynolds is seeing. She's seeing excitement on the ground. She's seeing people are really taking this caucus very, very serious. And I believe the greater the number of the voters, uh, the more it's going to benefit an alternative to Trump than, say, President Trump. And can can independents, I mean, you mentioned same day registration, but is it is it closed? In other words, do you have to be a Republican to vote? I get you can you bet you can you can vote that day, but you still have to at one point register as a Republican, right? You have to register. You can't be a Democrat or independent and then participate in the Republican caucus. You have to register as a Republican according to the registration guidelines. They did change some of that, so I want to make sure I'm right on that. Eight years ago, you could do it right up. You could fill out the registration card and Republican, participate in the caucus. I want to make sure that's the case yet. Yeah. I think it is, but if not, we can definitely get back to you on that. All right, folks, you've heard me talk about my friend Leo Grillo. He is the founder of Delta Rescue. And how it all came to be is an interesting story. He was out one day, he found a Doberman that had been abandoned. I mean, and this Doberman was underweight, clearly in need of health. Leo rescued the Doberman, named him Delta. And guess what Delta stands for? Dedication and everlasting love to animals. It's an acronym. And that's what Leo then turned his mission into, is a lifelong, the largest no kill sanctuary in the world. And that's what Delta Rescue is all about. And it relies solely on contributions from people like me and you, animal lovers that want to do their part. But beyond the regular donation you can give, which they appreciate, if you are an animal lover, you can make them part of your estate uh, so that you can grow your estate while helping animals in the future. And that's what's so important is it becomes an enduring mission for Leo and for you uh, that you get to be part of this li living legacy for these animals. Go to deltarescue.org to learn more, to see not just how you can help in the here and now, but in the future, check out their estate planning kit at deltarescue.org. So, so let's get into the state of play right now. Um, you know, right now you're, you're right. I mean, Trump, Trump has a big lead there right now. When, when I was there in 2016, I think the big issue, and you brought this up in terms of what, where I think part of the polling got it wrong, was that it's one thing to poll people. And you walk through the Iowa caucus process. It's another thing to show up and to stand in a corner at a VFW mm -hmm. or church hall or somebody's house for 60 to 90 minutes, you know, two hours. And that's where I think polling sometimes doesn't, doesn't, isn't precise because I can be for somebody. But I can say, I just don't know that I have two hours on a Wednesday night or, you know, in this case, a Monday night to stand somewhere for two hours long. I got kids, I got, they got homework, they got basketball practice, right? So that's where I think the impreciseness kind of fits into this whole thing. And I, I, I think that's where you mentioned this. How important is that, you know, that ground game, those caucus commitment cards? It, it, it's everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's why when I take a look at, uh, so when Trump releases, I have 150 faith leaders endorsement. 
uh, I actually go through there and I take a look at who's endorsing it. And when Ron DeSantis says, I have 99 county chairs, I really look at and go, okay, who are his county chairs? Because what I'm trying to assess, Sean, is who do they have that can actually move numbers? Because there's some people like Troy Sharman uh, in Southeast Iowa, Van Buren County. If you have Troy Sharman there, uh, you can rest assured he's bringing a lot of people with him because he just, and Ron DeSantis has Troy Sharman. If right. you have somebody else, might be like, I'm not sure who that person is. I mean, it might be a name on a page, but who is that person? Uh, so it, it's definitely a organizational exercise. And Sean, you know how tough it is to poll a general election. Right. It gets tougher to poll a primary election, and it gets way tougher to poll an Iowa caucus. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. I will say this, having been out there a couple of times in the last few months, I think Trump's ground game is exponentially better than it was when he first ran in 20, 2015. And I also think, to your point, that the DeSantis ground game is, is right up there as well. And that's where those two things are going to come into play. And, and I, I agree with you. I think the Nikki Haley thing, it's great to have. We're going to get to this in a second. But I think having that ground game is critical to making sure that you can not just identify people, but say, okay, are you willing to stand here for two hours? Are you willing to mm. show up on caucus night? Are you available? And, you know, will you, will you bring a friend? Those are the kind of things that make a difference as opposed to just saying, I'm supporting you. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's kind of get into you and the role that you've played. You have successfully chosen the last three winners or rather not chosen, but endorsed the last three winners of the Iowa caucuses. Right. So that's good on you. Right. That shows the, the importance. I mean, to your point about bringing sure. people along, the, the question I have for you is what is, in your opinion, the role of the Iowa caucuses? Because as much as you've chosen and endorsed the three winners, none of them have gone on to win the mm -hmm. nomination. So there's always this battle between New Hampshire and Iowa as to what their role is. What do you see the role of Iowa caucuses? I really see the role of the Iowa caucuses is, is to narrow the field. Okay. Uh, to to kind of narrow the field to say, okay, we've measured all of them, and these are the two or three that we believe should go on. And now let New Hampshire go through their process, South Carolina, the early states, and start making their decision. That said, we've done that very effectively, by the way. You know, I think uh, whether it was Mike Huckabee and Mitt Romney and John McCain in 2008, you had uh, Rick Santorum and Mitt Romney in 2012. And then in 2016, you had Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, and Marco Rubio. So we narrowed the field. I think we've done that exceptionally well. So the this interesting time, thing is, but, but, but this time, the field is actually, it's seemingly much smaller going exactly. into Iowa in terms of viable candidates, right? You, you mentioned the four, and I think you're absolutely right. That's who is, except for, I would say, Chris Christie isn't campaigning in Iowa. He's yeah. staked everything on, on New Hampshire. But- if you if you had to say that your job is to winnow to narrow the field, who of the four, how many tickets do you think are out of Iowa? Because even if it's three, you, you drop one. How many people make it out of Iowa? Well, that's where I was just about ready to go, Sean. Is I think this time Iowa's different. Uh, I think there's one ticket out of Iowa, and when I say one ticket, it's really two. You already have to say that Donald Trump's going to go out of Iowa, right? So you have to get one more, and and I believe. That's why Ron DeSantis is staking everything on Iowa. Nikki Haley's putting everything on Iowa. Like we need to get out of Iowa either as the clear alternative to Trump, meaning I got really close to him, but I still came in second, or I overtook him. Right. And so I think Iowa this time, and I've said it right, all the way along, it's ground zero uh, as far as who moves on. Does that mean you're going to be able to beat Trump if you beat him in Iowa? That remains to be seen. But it does give us an opportunity. Is it the president or is there an alternative? Right. And I think that's right. I mean, but but let's kind of go through to make sure we're, we're level set on this. I agree with you. I mean, everybody's all in on Iowa except Chris Christie. I asked Vivek Ramaswamy on this show, I don't know, a week and a half ago. And he basically said, if I don't do well, he added New Hampshire and he tried to give a caveat because I said, if you sure. don't get, do well in Iowa, are you out? And he said, well, it'd have to be in the first two states. So So aside from that, let's just play a game for a little bit. If DeSantis doesn't come close to Trump, considering everything that he has staked on on Iowa and his super PAC has been all in, do you agree that a close second, barring that, he's got it, he, he doesn't play on? 
I, I think he has to have a close second or he needs to win. And and I think he knows that as well. Yeah, and I think I he agree. believes Iowa's that that important. And obviously he's I mean, no one would make that call today to say, hey, if I don't do that, I'm out because you don't know the dynamics then. Uh, but there's definitely some reassessing that would have to go on in his campaign if he doesn't get a close second or overtake the former president. And do you agree that that's probably the same with both Vivek and Nikki? I think it's very, very critical for Vivek to have an exceptional strong showing in Iowa in order for him to go on. I think if right. he gets in the single digits, uh, he may still play in New Hampshire, but I don't think he's going to be all that valid in New Hampshire. For Nikki Haley, I think she needs to have an exceptional strong showing. If she stays at that 15% mark and say DeSantis gets to that 30 to 40% mark, I think now she has to reassess her effort right now. Right. Because the one thing, and I've said this to the candidates, your very candidacy tells me that you believe there needs to be an alternative to the former president. Because if you didn't believe that, you wouldn't be running. You'd be backing him. So if there's going to be an alternative, it's got to get down to a head to head. It's got to be a one on one or as we saw in 2016, and it'll be more so in 2024, Trump will win by the power of division. So you either need to get to a head to head or you're OK with Trump being the nominee. Well, so we've talked about your endorsement a little. I want to get to that further. We've talked about the ground game that Trump and DeSantis have. Nikki Haley just got endorsed yesterday by the Coke backed Americans for Prosperity. Mm -hmm. This is, they're pledging millions of dollars in mail, in phones, in television. Um, and I think getting back to that ground game, they say that they've got this network that rivals the RNC in terms of their ground game, that they're gonna put it on the ground in Iowa, in the primary, in the caucus states. Uh, how important is that when it comes to that ground game in Iowa specifically? You know, uh, the Koch brothers have been around for a long time. You know that they've been playing here with Americans for Prosperity. Uh, and I have respect for them as well. I just don't think they're they're in the natural caucus lane. That's not their natural habitat is the caucus lane. As a matter of fact, um, I think there's even some AFP people in Iowa who are not all that happy because they see this as a very top-down move very, mm -hmm. ver versus a grassroots organization move. And some of them have even told me, you know, they're, thinking, they're considering leaving. Um, and if that happens, what they're going to do is they're going to go more to a DeSantis. And I think also that becomes a, a big effort there as well. So I saw the Koch brothers being all in to find an alternative to Trump. They were just going mailings against Trump, against Trump, against Trump. Uh, now that they're going in for Nikki, I'm not sure how that's going to play, especially when you have Governor Reynolds. If I had to choose Koch brothers or Governor Reynolds, I'd choose Governor Reynolds every day that ends in Y. And, and, and look, I, there's no question how popular Kim Reynolds is, right? I mean, I, I I was with her at the Iowa State Fair. I saw people walking up to her. I've known Kim since she was lieutenant governor. But but here's the question I have for you. The difference is that's an endorsement. You bet. What, what Kim, what the AFP offers is that actual, that, that grassroots, the money, the people that are knocking on the doors. And so I, I kind of view it as apples and oranges. Do you disagree? Well, not so much because she's an endorsement. But if you're living in Iowa right now, Sean, you would see she's on TV every night in a commercial backing Ron DeSantis. She's on mailers at every home backing Ron DeSantis. The Never Back Down Pack backing Ron DeSantis is knocking on doors. They have tons of, they have way more door knockers than AFP does. And they're out there just saturating the doors. And a lot of it's with Kim Reynolds. So I would say, again, uh, I think her endorsement is exceptionally important and how they're using her endorsement. Because, you know, you can have an endorsement. If it's the name on the page, it's not going to mean a whole lot. Right. But if you're actually going to use it, what she's doing, uh, I think it could have a, an exceptional benefit. All right. So let's talk about your endorsement. You are the family leader, uh, is very, uh, speaks to the, the evangelical, the religious community. What did you look at when it came to issues of faith in terms of evaluating mm -hmm. the top candidates? What were the, the discerning differences that you saw between those top four candidates? Yeah. It's a really good question. And I think the first thing I'd say, Sean, is that we were blessed by an exceptional cadre of candidates. Uh, these people are very talented. Uh, they're good. I think they'd all be uh, capable of doing the job. And so even when I told media six months ago, and I think it's more true today, the number one thing that really rose to the top of our base this time, me in particular as well, 
is who can win in 2024? Uh, Because you need to win. If you really believe it's the most important election of our lifetime, and a lot of us believe that, including myself, then you need to win. And once you win, you need someone who can serve two terms, not be a lame duck on day one. You need someone who can defend the country versus defending themselves. You need someone who has a a vision for the country versus being vindictive about the past. And that's why it really came down of who can win, because there's going to be more Supreme Court justices to a point. Uh, You really do need to drain the swamp. You really do need to control this border. You really do need to ensure religious liberty. So there's a lot of things on the domestic front and on the international front that you need a leader today. And when we measured that up, uh, we saw Ron DeSantis as being someone who takes Florida off the map. He actually experienced the red wave in Florida that the whole country should have experienced, one in demographics that that he shouldn't have won in, and by being a bold and courageous leader. So therefore, for me, that's what I assessed in regards to someone in the win, someone who can serve two terms, put a team around them that can actually do this job to drain the swamp and secure the border. All right, guys, most of us know what it's like to be without power, sometimes for an hour, maybe a day, a couple days after a natural disaster, a hurricane, a windstorm, you know, whatever. But now national security experts are warning that our power grid is more vulnerable than ever. And they've identified nine key substations, which if attacked, they're saying we could lose power for months, months. That's why having your own solar power is more important than ever. So I recommend the Patriot Power Generator, which is a solar generator that you don't have to install in your house. It's portable. You can take it with you. You can use it inside your house. And it's powerful enough that if power goes out, we're talking your phones, your tablets, your computers, medical devices, even your refrigerator gets power. So if you go to fourpatriots.com and use code SPICER, you get 10% off your first purchase. It's four patriots.com includes that patriot power generator you'll get a uh that guarantee for a year free shipping if it's over 97 bucks and a portion of every sale is donated to charities that support veterans right that's great so go to fourpatriots.com use code spicer fourpatriots.com you do not want to be without power in case something happens so so let's let's put the two term issue aside for a moment because i i i I'm not I'm not entirely on board on that, but okay. let's and I will give Governor DeSantis a ton of credit. I think he's been a fantastic governor. He stood up for woke pol- against woke politicians. He was a champion during covid. Uh, I mean, you go look at what he's done on on gender, um, on universities. I mean, he I, I, I think he's been a fantastic governor. I have nothing mm-hmm. negative to say about how he's governed, how he's led. In fact, I think he should be, a, he's a model for a lot of other governors. And he signed the six week abortion ban. Uh, so he's been a leader on life and faith issues as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I concede everything. The one thing I would say about Trump is that when it comes to people, you and I have been in the game a long time, Bob. And I feel like too many times we see candidates that come along and pander to the evangelical community, to pander to the religious community. Mm-hmm. And they get in office, they might establish some stuff. And then they talk about why they can't get this through or they can't get this through. What I saw with Trump is somebody who actually did it, right? He appointed pro-life judges up and down the, the, the different various levels of the federal bench. Uh, he, he did a lot on religious liberty. Uh, he fought, uh, you know, in terms of doing things for Israel as well. What is it that you saw? I mean, the thing I look at Trump and say, okay, if you care about religious liberty, if you care about life as an issue, Trump actually showed that he, he'll he do it, and he was successful at it. So what, what I would say to that, Sean, and, and I agree with you about what Trump did in 2016, but I'd also say to you and to your audience, he's not the same guy. What I'm saying about not the same guy, uh, he threw the pro-life community under the bus for the midterm elections. He said the fetal heartbeat bill, which Governor DeSantis signed, Kim Reynolds signed, South Carolina signed, a lot of other states, way too harsh. It was awful. He went on CNN, Caitlin Collins, saying we're willing to make a deal on life where both sides are going to be happy. And he's called Christians pieces of manure. I'm just saying he's not the same guy. I think in 2016 and getting elected, and he knew that in a, in a big part, evangelicals put him over that finish line. Right. I think transactionally thought you did well by me. I'll do well by you. Right. And that's, but, and, but, but you know what? At the end of the day, 
I, I've seen people run for office who were evangelical, sure. who didn't get stuff done. And if it takes something transactional to achieve stuff for the movement, I mean, I look at Trump when people ask me, how can you support the guy or how could you have worked for him or whatever it is. I go down the list and I go as a conservative, both economically and, and socially, I go, I've been told for decades about things that are going to get done. And I look at Donald Trump tax cuts, what he did in, in, in domestic, uh, you know, other domestic areas, what he did for the judges, what he did for life, what he did for our border, all of these things. And then on foreign policy, you may not like some of the style, but I would rather have deliverables. I mean, we have now young, vibrant Supreme Court justices that will go on for a decade and have a massive impact. We had previous people appoint people who, frankly, were you know, uh, well, we can get them through and this is it. He fought. I mean, if he didn't stand there and fight for Brett Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh wouldn't have gotten through. Most other mm -hmm. politicians would have walked away in a second as soon as the water got hot. He stayed in there and fought for him. And I, I think that that's worth something. Oh, it's definitely worth something. You and I agree on that. I'm just saying that the 2016 Donald Trump is not the 2024 Donald Trump. And, and the environment is different. He's going to be on a constant cloud of indictment. They're all going to be after him. I think the train wreck down ballot is going to be awful. I think you're going to have a bloodbath. So when people say he can win in these swing states, I tell them, stop looking, <clears throat> excuse me, stop looking at the polls. Look at the ballot box. 2022, every poll said it was going to be a red wave. Tucker Carlson, who's a friend of mine, said it's going to be a tsunami, a red tsunami. It never materialized. Why? The exit polling, even of the, the 2023 elections, they don't like who's at the who's the face of the party right now. That's why they're not voting with us. I but you also, but, but, but can I just push back on a second? Here's the thing. And this isn't I'm not trying to make this a Trump DeSantis thing, sure. but I will say that when Trump was on the ballot. Right. So in 2016, in 2020 and on 2024, he actually picked up seats. It's when he's not on the ballot that people, I think, don't feel like they're going out supporting Donald Trump. That's the, there is something to that because you actually can, you know, if you go back and look at the numbers in 2020 and in 2024, they picked up seats in the House. Uh, well, we haven't gone to 2024 yet. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 2020 and 20, yeah, 2016 but, and 2020. So when you take a look at that, though, I think 2021, the Georgia race, uh, Trump may not have been on the ballot, but he was on the ballot in 21. And we yeah. lost the Georgia races. 2022, Trump may not have been on the ballot. But he was on the ballot. I mean, the, the Democrats made him the focus. 2023, I believe he was on the ballot as well. I'm saying we lost in 2020. We lost in 21. We lost in 22. We lost in 23. I think for this party, we need to turn the page with someone who's won in demographics that we don't win in, takes a competitive state off of the map, so we put resources different places, and then can serve two terms. The other part I'd say, though, Sean, to use this, because you served with them, is who's Trump going to get to serve with him in the second term. Because a lot of his people, those closest to him are being sued into financial distress or ruin, and he has shown no propensity to have their back. I can't believe somebody would say, I'll sign up and I'll join you under the threat of, I'm gonna have my family be in financial distress because of me working with you. That's yeah. a big issue. So let me ask you, you brought up 2023, and I, I don't wanna get sideways on this, but I think you, your perspective is important on this. I live here in Virginia. Uh, I believe I was very vocal about this. I think Republicans have blown the abortion issue. We fought for years to get Roe v. Wade overturned to send it back to the states. And instead, I saw so many candidates who were in Virginia getting pummeled on this issue of abortion. And instead of going back, I believe that Democrats and the left have the extreme position. They want abortion Amen. up until death. I mean, excuse me, up until birth. And it's, it's literally here in Virginia, we have the former governor, a physician on audio at, in an interview that he did on radio saying, we wait for the baby to come out to make a decision. That's called murder. That's killing. Amen. We have not prosecuted the case against the left and against the Democrats on abortion effectively. How do you think we should be handling this issue because I feel like too many people are, no pun intended, in the fetal position, just allowing the Democrats to pummel them on the issue of life instead of standing up for it and saying, you're the extremist. We stand with science that proved the viability of a fetus. And you guys are the nutty, crazy left wing extremists. Totally agree with you. And one is, Sean, is I think you have to be authentic about it. You really need to believe in the sanctity of human life, number one. Right. Because you can fool a fool, you can con a con, you can't kid a kid, you can't kid a voter. 
So therefore, you need to believe it, number one. You need to stop playing games with it. And so, for example, to bring it back to Governor DeSantis and Governor Reynolds, two governors that experienced red waves in their state in 2022, both signed the heartbeat bill. They didn't walk away from it. They defended and advocated effectively the culture of life versus a culture of death. They made that distinction. I think Governor DeSantis will do that with Newsom tomorrow night in the debate because California wants to be an abortion destination. So you brought this up. Uh, this debate tomorrow night on Fox, Hannity mm -hmm. has got Newsom and and uh, and DeSantis on. I, look, I thought that this was a smart idea when it when it first came up, right? And they and frankly, I think that, that they should have done it then. And they got in this back and forth. I think the timing. Be, through the negotiations or whatever, it's now you know going to happen. Now, I, I I think that DeSantis missed a moment. He could have been there showing that he can take on the Democrats. What do you think's at stake tomorrow night? Because I, I feel like it's diminished the value of the debate right now. That there's not the impact. There's not as much interest. Do you disagree with that, or do you think that this is going to be a big moment for DeSantis? Yeah, well, I'll disagree for, disagree with it from an Iowa perspective. Okay. I know a lot of caucus scores can't wait to watch that. And if DeSantis shows, I think it comes at the right time. Because Labor Day is typically when you look at a timing for a general election that's going to be held in November. Thanksgiving is a time frame when you start looking at, say, an Iowa caucus or a New okay. Hampshire primary. So it, it coming on November 30, if DeSantis shows, listen, this is the state of Florida. This is a Republican-led state of Florida, bold and courageous leadership. And this is the crazy, whacked-out California under that leadership. I think people are going to say, that's how you take down a Democrat. That's who can win in 20. I think this is a crucial debate for him. And if he scores heavily on this, I think that could be your game-change moment in the state of Iowa. Okay. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I Again, I, I don't just, I, I think there's, Maybe the way I should have put this is I think it could have been more impactful. I think that they, if they'd done this earlier, a lot of people who were waiting to look at DeSantis versus Haley could have said, ah, look at that guy taking on, you know, what, what the Democrats have said is their future in, in Gavin Newsom. But by yeah, that, delaying that it. True. That may be true. But when I take a look at Iowa, I was always broke late, say Huckabee, Santorum, Cruz, they always break late. Right. I think this timing wise is almost perfect for the state of Iowa right now. Let me ask you this. If you know, you brought this up earlier, but now, and I keep thinking about because we're now talking about, you know, the impact that this might have. Let's say that Ron DeSantis crushes it tomorrow night. He has an amazing night and he starts to pick up through your endorsement, through Kim Reynolds' endorsement, through this ground game, uh, and he beats Donald Trump in Iowa. Do you think, what, what does that do to Trump? I think what it does, it, it now forces America to have a vote. And I, I honestly believe, and this is not against the former president, I right. still consider him a friend. It's, I just think it's kind of business right now. I think Iowa would do America a favor by giving a clear alternative to Trump and not let America choose. Do you want the former president? If, if, if he wins, if he wins, Bob, if, if Trump wins the nomination, are you 100% behind him? Well, I always tell people, elections come down to choices. And there's yep. a lot of things that are going to happen between now and then. So let's have that conversation then. But let's oh, wait, have hold on. I just want to be clear. You bet. That because my, my answer has always been, I will vote for the nominee no matter who that is. I can't, the idea that there's a choice between Joe Biden, who I think has been horrible for the country and horrible for life. And you, you know, we could spend a two, two more shows on this. Yeah. If there, if Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican party, would you have a problem supporting him? It, 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 I'm telling you, Sean, you may have always made that decision. I never have. Even when, really? I, ran, even when I ran for governor, I said, listen, We'll make that decision. But, but once, Bob, I'm just, listen, you know, I, here's well, what I don't get. If, Biden versus, if it's a Biden administration versus a Trump administration, yeah. there's no decision. There, right, right, right. right. So That's what, what I'm saying is that you are very yeah. clear on the issues that you care about. And, and I just can't see any world in which Bob Vanderplatz votes for anyone but the Republican nominee. On, so, in, what, in, so what I'm saying, though, is that that's beholden on not you and me. That's beholden on the former president, President Trump, say, make sure you seal the deal. Make sure you close the deal on this. Don't take anything for granted. That helps him, not hurts him. And so I think we're hold, we're we're focused on the caucus right now in the primary. We'll let the general election play when that takes place. But I would say and, I want to go back to your life issue just yeah. for a second. The nuanced position that he has taken on the life issue, I believe, causes us to get beat on the life issue. He's a big voice. And even when I looked at the exit polling out of Ohio, 
a lot of it had to do with they do not like who's the current face of our party at all. Yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, so as we go forward, I mean, that's look, my view is I, I get it. And I think he's trying to figure out how to position himself. But I also look at the record uh, that he had as four years and say when it came down to it and fighting for judges and not just nominating them, but standing by them, that shows me a lot. Uh, and I think he also understands the impact. Did you get any, look, I, I was, I was down at Mar-a-Lago a week ago. There's a lot of evan- evangelicals that are with him. You obviously represent a lot in Iowa. Is there any blowback that you guys got at all from, from other evangelical leaders, either in Iowa or around the country who are standing with him? A- absolutely not. Matter of fact, we got a lot of support, a lot of encouragement, uh, a, a lot of guard your back type stuff. And we're praying for you. But no, not not blowback at all, because I think they know how we deal with this. Uh, we dealt yeah. with this with Cruz, Santorum, and Huckabee. We have a record of it. Again, this is not against the former president. This just happens to believe my belief. We would be wise to turn the page. And I do believe, Sean, just like I do say my wife, Darla, we build trust day by day, moment by moment. But it doesn't take a lot to destroy that trust. Yeah, Trump did a lot of good in 2016. His comments on life currently and recently are not going to be the winning message or the champion we need for the sanctity of human life right now. I want to ask you one question, and I, I, I just want you to clear the air on this. I know that you've right. touched on it before, but there were a lot of accusations thrown your way from the Trump campaign and others about the, the endorsement of the family leader being up for grabs, up for sale. Can you address that? Oh, I'd love to. First of all, the family leader is not endorsing. Bob Aaron is endorsing. But and that's I, just to be clear, that's you, I, I didn't, so, so you are, in, when you endorse, it's as Bob Vander Plaats, an individual, not as the head personal. of the So the family okay. leader is on safe harbor. No money will come out of here whatsoever to, to go for a candidate or against a candidate. So with our deal, Sean, and you know how this gets played as well. If you want to come to our leadership summit and you want to be, have a table at our dinner, that's going to be $20,000, whether you're Sean Spicer or whether you're, uh, Ron DeSantis or Vivek Ramaswamy, and they wanted to be part of that to be part of the influencers because the IRS says, I cannot make a donation. So those are the things, not just Ron DeSantis, which Trump's campaign loves to point out, but Vivek Ramaswamy, Tim Scott, and all of them had access. And nobody got denied stage time. The red carpet was rolled out. Donald Trump knows better than anybody. My endorsement's never banned and never will be for sale. That that money did not go to buy. It went to the ministry, but the IRS says we had to do that because we can't make a contribution to a candidacy. And so that's why Vivek Ramaswamy flew his wife of Porva in because she he wanted her to be at that dinner. To me, it was smart politics by DeSantis and, and the other candidates who participated. Uh, so, but Trump wants to say, hey, the endorsement was for sale. Sean, you and I know each other very well. 12 years ago, that that case was made against me with Rick Santorum, but for a million bucks. Uh, my endorsement went- is not for sale, <laughs> especially for 90 grand, it's not for sale. I was going to say then in the Biden economy, that's not worth as much. Um, <laughs> Bob, let me just end this with here. Put your crystal ball on. Tell me on the day after the Iowa caucuses, if you had to sort of just, you're pulling this out, what does what the ranking look like in terms of percentages? Who comes out of Iowa? It's a great question. I played with this the other day, and maybe it's a chosen narrative, but I really believe it could happen. Uh, I think DeSantis can get 42. I think Trump will get 37. I think Nikki will get somewhere in the teens, and it could be all the way from 14 to 17. And I think Vivek shows up somewhere in the single digits. I'm just not sure where in the single digits. I think that really can happen. If I didn't believe it could happen, I would not have endorsed. And mm-hmm. I don't think Kim Rose would have endorsed either if she didn't see a pathway to victory. Okay. I always appreciate your insight, Bob. Thanks for being here. I wish you and your family a very blessed and safe uh, Christmas holiday season. And I look forward to seeing you maybe out in Iowa to see how this all shakes out. All right. God bless you, Sean. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. All right, folks. What an amazing conversation. I think that this was awesome. If you want to understand the Iowa caucuses, Bob, let us understand what's at stake. So, uh, you know, agree or disagree with the endorsement that he made, but I think you learned a lot about how this is going to shake out and where the process goes from Iowa. As I said, 47 days from now on that quest to 1,215 delegates to become the Republican nominee. Thanks for tuning in. Drop me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, 
Rumble or YouTube, hit that notification and subscription buttons for us. Shoot me a text, 571-441-4991. We'll see you back here tomorrow on the Sean Spicer Show with a great panel discussion. Have a great night. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.